thanks for joining us, uh, Dwight. Uh, I think the probably the best place to start is to have you give a bit of an introduction to yourself and share um, a little bit about your background and, and what you're up to these days. Yeah, I'd be glad to do that. Um, uh, Dwight Jones, I've uh, worked a number of jobs in uh, education, in uh, public and as well as in the private sector. I've had an opportunity to be a um, elementary and middle school teacher. I've been an elementary, middle, and high school principal. I've worked as an assistant superintendent, and then I've been a superintendent in um, really three different school districts. One, Fountain for Carson School District, which is right here in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Then I had an opportunity to work as superintendent in the Clark County School District, which is Las Vegas, Nevada. Clark County is the fifth largest school district in the country. At that time, we had about 320,000 kids. Um, so that was a very unique and a rewarding experience. And then most recently, I was the interim superintendent um, for Denver Public Schools. I've also worked as the Colorado State Commissioner of Education. And then in the private sector, I've had an opportunity to work for um, Discovery Education, as well as I was a uh, executive vice president with McGraw Hill, which is a pretty large publishing publishing company. So, and then a, a few opportunities, you know, uh, in a charter school here and there. And so it's been a wonderful 38 years in education. So you certainly had an impact across the country for sure. And and perhaps even beyond. So um, great to be speaking with you this morning. So, um, so what we're going to be focusing on, though, together is is really this this concept, and it's been labeled a lot of different ways. Um, but the 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 probably the most well known is the achievement gap. Um, sometimes I hear people talk about the opportunity gap, um, but really what we're we're talking about. Um, Richard Milner um, has kind of defined this opportunity gap as. Um, what, what, what demonstrates essentially inequities in the system structures and practices um, within education that can prevent children from reaching their potential. So pretty broad, um, but I think we probably need to think pretty broadly um, in terms of who are these students, what kind of gaps are we really talking about? Um, and so I'm curious, kind of how do you think about this concept of opportunity or achievement gap, or maybe you call it something different, but uh, curious how you're, how, how you're thinking about it. Yeah, I, I appreciate that, Todd. I I have, as you can imagine, thought a lot about it, been involved in it pretty much uh, in every aspect of my career. I, I think whether you call it the achievement gap, that there is a difference between uh, certain groups of youngsters and maybe their counterparts that might be Caucasian or wealthy, or there's a variety of ways that you might look at it, or uh, a gap between those that might have... Uh, IEP and those that might not, or, um, you know, the opportunity gap that, you know, all students are getting the same opportunity and that could be viewed as access to rigorous coursework. Um, it could be, you know, access to college readiness and, and certain, uh, high level, uh, classes and opportunities in schools, or it could even be access to, you know, certain, um, opportunities that might be associated with activities or athletics or a variety of things. So there's a lot of ways you can look at it. I've uh, also talked about it as a learning gap, that there is a gap between, you know, we, we say right up front that all kids can learn and have the capacity to learn, but certainly there can be a gap in sometimes what the expectations are and, um, you know, at what level are students learning. Um, Matter of fact, I was having a conversation with some educators today that was really talking about whether, you know, you should, kids that are behind, do you actually, you know, uh, interface with them at the level where they're at, or do you actually continue to teach them at a higher level? And it was quite a debate because, you know, the a lot of educators, I think, have taken the approach that, you know, you kind of start where a student is and then raise them up from there. But there were some on in this conversation that said that actually is low expectations and continue to have them instructed below grade level. That actually you continue to teach students at grade level and you find different um, supports or, you know, figure out how you're going to catch them up on where the gaps might be in their learning. You know, uh, during the pandemic, 
a lot of school districts were using different tutoring companies. So they said that could be a approach that a tutoring company could do that if you identify where the gaps are, keep instructing them at a high level, but let the tutoring company kind of help them catch up on some of the learning gaps that they might have. And that way they continue to get exposed because, you know, the assessment is going to be a high level assessment. And what we find, especially in mainly, not always, but a lot of our urban centers is many times kids haven't even been instructed at the level that they're going to be assessed. And then we wonder why they don't do well on the high stakes assessment. So Todd, I know that's a really long answer to a fairly simple question, but um, yeah, I, I think it's probably all learning gap, achievement gap. <laughs> you know, I think it's all of those things combined. So interesting to unpack it a little bit more is um, is thinking about what drives these gaps. And you alluded to it a little bit. And um, I think of uh, an individual, Bettina Love, uh, who speaks a lot about gaps of sorts and 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 the racism that that can exist in any organization let alone schools um and uh, she just gave a speech she has a new book coming out she's out at teachers college in uh in new york and and certainly racism whoever has racism in the schools whether adults or kids can impact and influence um some forms of of achievement gaps or opportunity gaps but how do you think of the other, uh, or that or other drivers that create these gaps? Yeah, Todd, that, uh, you know, I've had an opportunity, I think, to really spend some time with some really smart people and some research folks and, and folks that, you know, have really focused on, I'll just call it the achievement gap for the sake of kind of what I've called it most of my career. And, you know, um, I know when I was a superintendent in Fountain Fort Carson, just outside of Colorado Springs, Governor Owens assigned me to an achievement gap commission that he had started. And part of the work that we were trying to do here in Colorado was really to try to determine what were some of the criteria that was causing this gap. And we were looking at it based on academics, that um, Caucasian counterparts were achieving at a higher level, whether it was literacy whether it was math or, you know, science, whatever the content area was, there was a, a gap between primarily uh, students based on racial uh, and socioeconomic background. So um, let's use African-Americans, for example. There was a considerable gap between the level in third grade literacy that the Caucasian students might be achieving versus the black students or the African-American students. Same thing occurred uh, primarily for uh, Latinx students. Um, and then, you know, if you used also uh, socioeconomic, students that were low income had a considerable learning gap between those that were, you know, medium to higher level uh, income. So those gaps exist. I think states have really been studying it for a long time. I think we probably know how some of those exist. Um, you know, I just looked recently at some of the assessments that Colorado just took the CMAS exam and the gap still exists. And in some cases they're widening. Um, so even though we've been studying it a long time and there's been lots of commissions and folks that have worked on it, I'm still not sure how we've solved it. And right now in Colorado, Caucasian students continue to elevate and go higher. And even minority students are actually increasing but the gap is still widening. So even though, you know, that rising tide maybe is raising all boats, it's raising some boats higher. <laughs> and so that's still a challenge that we're kind of dealing with here, um, you know, and still trying to figure out. So thinking about how to figure figure it out, um, what, what have you seen that's working well, even though these gaps do persist, even if all the boats are rising, like you mentioned, um, what what seems to work because there are pockets of improvement whether they're at the district level or states in some cases um, have really outperformed i think it was mississippi i last read about um, who over a decade has really made a big difference um, in their some of their gaps but what what have you seen that's working yeah i i think there's a, a number of things that have worked um you know there's never a substitute for just good instruction um high level instruction by you know, well-trained and qualified teachers, certified teachers really have a positive impact. Um, I think there's 
no exception for research-based curriculum, that you do need to have strong curriculum that gets the results um, that is research-based. Um, you know, right now there's a lot of conversations. I, I call it revisiting because I've been around a long time, but, you know, the whole uh, science of reading. And you know that there's some push to be back to, you know, phonemic awareness and really looking at vocabulary and comprehension and some of the things that we have said are really important to teaching a student how to read. Um, and, you know, a little bit of the kind of whole language approach seems to, you know, there's, there's kind of a controversy back and forth, you know, and in education, sometimes I always think the pendulum swings too far one way. And once we say it's gone too far one way, do we bring it back to the middle? No, we typically swing it all the way back the other direction. So I hope that's not what is happening with literacy. It's probably a combination of, of both, but I'm not trying to have folks on each side start emailing me to say, Dwight, you don't know what you're talking about. It's, it's this or it's that. So certainly folks feel very strongly about it, but, but you know, good, good and Curriculum, research-based, strong, rigorous curriculum really does have a positive impact. And then, you know, there's also the importance of strong professional development. I know sometimes people think professional development might be a waste of time and resource, but if teachers and staff aren't trained well on what really works and, and that there's some diversity associated with different learners, that different learners learn in different ways, it's not that they can't learn. Sometimes are we making sure that we're uh, approaching them and teaching them in a way that they learn best? And sometimes that takes a lot of differentiation within a classroom. And, you know, if you have a classroom of 25 or 30 students, it's pretty hard to differ differentiate and give every student exactly what they need. And so I think folks are finding a variety of ways to break up lessons. And, you know, we've all heard of reading groups. You guys come to the table and Maybe there's a station of folks working over here and technology's gotten pretty good that kids can get some pretty good support and, and research, you know, using technology. So I think there is a variety of ways now that teachers can think about uh, differentiating in their classroom and it's not just up to the teacher to figure it out. I think folks are figuring it out and providing a lot of tools and resources that are really helpful. So I think there's a lot of things that can work. It's whether we're putting in the time and energy, uh, you know, that it takes to make sure it works, making sure we hire and support our teachers and in some cases making sure they're compensated well so that we can continue to attract the best and the brightest to education. Number two, making sure that not only are we doing PD, but it's the right PD and we're doing it with uh, folks that are really strong research based and and you know really training folks up on the things that are really have a positive impact and then that we are being pretty intentional i know ed reports um mississippi talks quite a bit about ed reports dr wright the former commissioner of education there a tremendous leader and a person that uh, i've reached out to a few times because she's just a great person to talk to and i think she would i don't want to speak for her but i think she would say Ed Reports has been beneficial in Mississippi that, you know, they they did say you had to have all green on the things that would have a positive impact on diverse learners. And if Mississippi is an example, and I know it's one you alluded to, Todd, I think that would be an example, but that's worked pretty well. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. And um, another two things I would add, actually, is one, um, as we know, almost in any kind of education intervention, earlier is better in terms of catching, you know, learning loss or, or, you know, gaps that will persist. And as you met, alluded to earlier, you can get wider um, for individual students, let alone groups of students. So I always think of, you know, pre-K, um, we should be making that more available to all families, regardless of their income. And, and certainly kindergarten is not ubiquitous in every state, right? Um, all day kindergarten. So Certainly, those are some other um, ways we can make a difference. Also, you mentioned uh, technology. I think um, there's both the what do we do about the gap, but also really clarifying where are those gaps, even at the classroom level, let alone at a school or district level. And so the data that we can collect um, and monitor so that we're making the appropriate interventions at the right time is really super critical. Um, what, what else should we, we be aware of as educators? And I maybe speak to your colleagues in terms of be the, the superintendents um, across the country. 
what what should they be make themselves aware of regarding the gaps? Um, you've alluded a bit to like what should they do, but in that particular role, how do you lead? How do you lead in this regard? Is it uh, um, creating a a more refined mission and vision for the district? Is it um, something else? Um, what, what, how does the superintendent make sure that this these gaps are being attended to? Yeah, yeah, I appreciate that, Todd, and and I appreciate you mentioning early childhood education. You know, I think in these kind of conversations, I just um, take that for granted that folks recognize the importance of preschool, early grade, sometimes even as early as three year old. And so I don't always speak to that as, uh, you know, maybe something that would, you know, that is necessary because I assume it exists. And you're exactly right, Todd. It doesn't exist in all states and is not always funded. Um, so therefore you get some haves and have nots and that's never good. We want to make sure that everybody has access should their parents choose, you know, that kids could start earlier. We know the importance of the early grades, um, you know, if, if you don't know that, just look at some of the research around students that are read to and those that are not and how they're able and more, and more prepared to enter school. We used to call it being ready by entry when I was superintendent in Las Vegas. So we had a ready by exit and ready by exit was not just when you exited the district to go on to something post-secondary or to the military. It was when you exited third, exited third grade. Are you ready for fourth grade? Or when you exited fifth grade, are you ready for sixth grade? So ready by exit was a theme that caught on pretty well that was simplistic because everybody could understand what that meant. And then you could develop the criteria that says, what is ready by exit? What does a third grader have to know and be able to do to effectively be ready to interact at fourth grade where the curriculum really takes a big jump or a shift? But we also um, really in talking with our community also said, we also need to think about ready by entry. And that is associated Todd with the early grades and the importance of preschool and, and early intervention. So I, I really appreciate you bringing it up. And I, I did not mention that on, I, I only didn't mention that because I just kind of always make an assumption that everybody understands that and then understands the importance of it. But to your point, um, as it relates to leadership, you know, there's a few uh, isms that I always go by, Todd, and you're probably going to say, yeah, I've heard that, I heard that, I heard that one. I, I still always say, keep the main thing the main thing. I think leaders, there are so many distractions in public education right now, from funding to, you know, unfortunately, it's gotten pretty political about uh, what students should read, what they shouldn't read, um, what they should be exposed to, whether you can say this word or say that word or or whether equity is still necessary or, or that you can even mention equity. I think there are some states across the country where even mentioning equity is unacceptable. And it's amazing with all our First Amendment rights and stuff that it's amazing what we say. You can't even say those things. And that's, that's you know, it's just a little reflection of the times. And so I think educators are being asked to do so much more and to manage so much more not just associated with educating kids, but feeding kids, making sure that transportation works. And since the pandemic, if you haven't uh, looked at some of the articles of the start of school, the biggest articles around transportation, just getting kids to school and the lack of bus drivers and, and you know, ways that especially those that don't have the means, how they're able to actually even get their youngsters to school. We, we say how important school is that we would never have thought that the challenge is sometimes just getting them through the schoolhouse doors. So I, I do think leadership has lots of distractions, but I, I still say the main thing is around teaching and learning. So I always encourage superintendents and principals and leaders to say, you still have to deal with distractions, but keep the main thing, the main thing. Uh, or another way of saying that is making sure you put the ladder on the right wall, you know, um, uh, any wall won't do. The right wall is we're going to make sure that there's literacy and strong instruction and that our teachers are absolutely supported. Um, so I, I think leaders have to keep their eye on the prize and stay pretty focused while they still lead and deal with so many distractions right now that we're asking our educators to deal with. But there is something about as strong instructional leaders 
strong instructional leaders know how to walk into a classroom and it doesn't take very long where you can tell is the is the instruction rigorous are kids engaged is it a lesson that is actually uh, associated with the standards and you don't even have to be there very long to get that really quick um, I think good leaders um, you know I always say there we used to talk about when I was a principal walls that talk you know, when people do bulletin boards and when student work is posted, is the work rigorous? Is it a great representation of what kids know and be able to do? And it is aligned to what we want kids to know and be able to do and to demonstrate that they know it. So I used to sometimes just be able to walk down the hallway and tell a lot about how a school that I was leading or a school that I was superintended in, how serious they were about achievement and how serious they were about kids learning. Just by the walls that talk, sometimes you didn't even have to go into a classroom and you could tell a lot about what was happening. So I think there's a lot of things that instructional leaders, now I keep saying instructional leaders because there's a lot of leaders that aren't instructional leaders. They themselves, you know, personally might not be able to teach at the level that they expect their teachers to teach at. And so I always say when we do PD around literacy instruction, important for principals to be right there. Make sure they're learning at the same level of their teachers and making sure if they're going into classrooms that they can support their teachers about, you know, the things that are really going to have the most positive impact. So um, leaders have to find a way to keep the main thing the main thing. Number two, I think they have to make sure that they continue to hone their skills. And as they offer PD to their teachers, put your butt in that seat right with the teachers and make sure you're learning at the same level the teachers are. And it demonstrates a lot to teachers, they know an instructional leader and they know who's not. And part of it is just your ability to show up and learn right with your staff. And then number three, I think just making sure that you help folks maintain high expectations. So walls that talk and rigorous work and making sure that all kids get access to not only, you know, the best curriculum and, and the best resources, but, um, you know, making sure that you're continuing to grow your staff so every kid gets access to a highly trained, well-qualified teacher. Those things have the biggest impact. And that's what leaders, in my opinion, have to ultimately spend their time on while they deal with all the distractions. Dwight, I can't say this uh, with more emphasis, I don't think, but the the um, incredible leaders that I've ever worked for or read about or what have you are those that can create focus and clarity for everybody on the team. <laughs> and what you just did in, in wrapping up this this uh, this talk we've had is, is just that. So I really appreciate how you've uh, brought it all together um, in the end and really focused on those very clear three practices that leaders can exemplify and and, and ensure that all students are gonna be supported, like you said, and, and also supported to a bar that is just as aggressive and, and, and high reaching as and any other student. So, Thanks so much for your for your time this morning. I appreciate it. Thank you, Todd, for this opportunity, and and always always appreciate uh, the opportunity to talk about good instruction and and what has an impact.